Hello you merry men and merry women. I'm Jonathan, also known as the PC Genie. Now, granted, I wouldn't normally be talking about things like folklore, but hey, someone of well one of my viewers requested it, so wish granted. I love bows. And I'm going to take a long shot and say that if you're watching this, and are so interested in Robin Hood, you love bows. Why do we love bows? My guess is that, um, well, in the time before Olympic archery and uh, sights and stabilizers and all of that, there was no pay to win. You wouldn't have anything that could give you laser guiding or scopes or anything that could give you an advantage. You get a bow, you train your strength up so you can get a bow that's really powerful and you get the right type of arrows with maybe things like shielded or parabolic fletchings, hogs back fletchings for long range, and a decent head, maybe some field points if you want to keep reusing them, or simple stuff like broadheads, bodkins, you've probably heard loads of them before and I won't bore you on that. The idea is you can pretty cheaply and easily get the bow you want and get the arrows you want and the quiver, maybe a bracer, and that's it. You're set. You draw that string back, you let go, and loose an arrow in the direction of your target. And if you're good, you're really good. Not because you're wealthy, but because you spent some time at the range, or spent some time poaching on the king's land, then you'll be a really good shot, and you'll get really good hits. And that's one of the beauties of archery. It's again that scenario where, in the time before any guiding systems or anything like that, the idea was it was a very literal and direct understanding of how skilled you are. If you are a poor shot, then of course you'll keep missing, you'll be slow on the knocking process. Those of you who don't know, uh, knocking is when you put the arrow in the string ready. If you're a really good archer, then you're quick as lightning on the knocking process, you draw smoothly, get that nice anchor point, and have a smooth release, BAM! And that satisfying wallop of your target getting punctured by your shot. <clears throat> and it is something that clearly has been a point of pride. It's still an Olympic sport today, and people in their millions go and watch people shooting arrows from bows and hitting their targets even if when you look at it from a third person perspective and completely dissect it, it is just a person pulling on a bent stick and it's making a, another pointy stick go into a thing. And yet it is so fascinating. It's just that general idea, isn't it? Where you've got that target or the butt and you manage to uh, get that shot knocked, gauge the wind instinctively, you maybe have that archer's paradox, which is where the stave of the bow pushes the arrow off at a slight angle. If you're right-handed, that would be pushing it off to the left slightly. And then you draw, you get that nice shot, and account for the drop and the range and everything that you've done, and then BAM! You've penetrated the butt at 100 paces. <laughs> but, um, yeah, jokes aside, Archery is something that has been very intrinsic to warfare for many hundreds, in fact thousands of years. And when you look at people like the English, it is something that is quintessential to them because of things like the Sunday practice laws and the idea that the common people must be good at archery. It does start to go into that idea of being superior and that idea of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor because it's not just a world where you've got people who are rich and can fight and people who are poor and can't fight, now the ground is more even because you've got people who can fight and are poor. So you've got to be careful and not go taxing them too hard or you're going to end up with a few arrows inside you. And I think in a way that's part of the allure of Robin Hood, the idea of taking down the big guy, being the underdog and still winning, that sort of concept where you are the person who maybe hasn't got all the money and resources in the world, you're not as rich as Batman, but you can still grab a decent weapon, use a lot of training and knowledge and experience, and show that big guy who's boss. Yeah. Now, English archers have been known for 
various different types of equipment and armour and whatnot through the ages, ranging from just post-Anglo-Saxon times, you know, around Norman Conquest and so on, where they'd be wearing little to no armour, maybe afford a helmet, maybe just wear some padded gambesons and such things, or perhaps have nothing at all as armour and just have ordinary clothing, hoping that they would be skirmishes, go in, shoot the enemy and run away again. But, you see in the later periods, archers are the sorts of people who can hold their own on the battlefield. They're the kinds of people who can do close combat. They're people who have been equipped with things like mail armour, salet helmets, brigandine armour, those sorts of things. And on top of that, because they had these laws to be so good at archery, like we mentioned before, it means that they are also able to use the time when they were learning to be be part of an army, they are able to learn the art of sword fighting, the art of close combat. So then, you're not just an archer who is great at long range and useless at short range, you become a formidable foe. You are able to hit the enemy at a long range, and you can keep yourself going in a fight at close range. And that's one of the key things that I think people overlook when they consider things like English archers. The idea that actually they're not just archers, they are archers and sword fighters. And one of the key things that we see in terms of sword fighting, even in the civilian context rather than a war context, is that people were training in styles like sword and buckler since even around the 1200s and before. So it's quite clear that people were learning to be very good in close combat. Now, of course, a longbow archer can't go around carrying a shield, a big shield, because of course they've got a bow and a quiver of arrows to carry around. So they've got to have something portable. So in most cases, and like we seem to be seeing in the Robin Hood types of folklore, is the fact that we have got people using arming swords, so single-handed weapons, and easily able to attach their belts, we see small shields known as bucklers. And these allow an archer to be a swashbuckler, a person who fights with sword and shield, but can realistically carry it around along with their archery equipment without being heavily impeded. With this medieval idea of someone being able to use long-range weapons and be good at close range, and especially with sword and buckler type of fighters, then we can quite literally say that people of the Robin Hood type of idea were the very first swashbucklers. So we all know of the romanticism that's happened later on and up into these times where you see people like the Three Musketeers, the Mask of Zorro, and all of those characters, but the very bedrock of this idea of the underdog, who maybe is someone who uses projectile weapons predominantly, but still being someone who is a swashbuckler, fighting hand-to-hand -hand with his opponents in a very honourable duel and winning out, is set by characters like Robin Hood. Now, one of the quintessential English weapons and the idea of a weapon for the common man that tends to get overlooked very strongly in this age of obsessing over swords and swordsmanship, which I admittedly am sort of helping become part of as well, is actually the humble quarter stuff. And yet, actually, when you look at the works of people like George Silver, and you look at characters like Little John in Robin Hood, we can see that it's a very important part of culture. The idea of having a weapon, again, similar to the longbow, something very cheap, a good stout wooden pole, maybe about four foot to about eight foot, depending on what you need, and being a sturdy weapon that is good for self-defense on the road, or potentially converted into something like, of course, a spear or another pole arm on the battlefield, is a very handy weapon indeed. And yet, like I say, it is something that does seem to be very overlooked these days. So I think it's worth giving at least a brief mention to characters like this or John and their abilities at wielding the quarterstaff. Now, in the movies, they still aren't doing very well with quarterstaff techniques, but the idea is you use it well, use both ends in a similar fashion to a paddle. You hit your opponent with the end, or if you perhaps bind with their own weapon and are intercepted on the way, you can then bring the rear end to bear, 
and you're able to do this back and forth, high and low, left and right, keeping your opponent busy, and of course using thrusts and other pushing motions with the ends to keep your opponent at bay. And actually, although it is, although a quarter staff wouldn't be seen on a battlefield, the idea of the weapon itself is very useful indeed, and a surprisingly effective self-defense weapon. Plus, like I said, having something like some iron added to it, and you can turn it into a battlefield quite easily anyway, without too much modification. Now, one of the things that we love so much about Robin Hood is the idea of him being a specialist. He is not just an archer, he is not just someone who has a bow and shoots people, he is the very best. He is the ultimate archer, and it's one of the things that people strive for. It's that idea of becoming something like the ultimate CEO, or the master craftsman, or something along those lines. It's that, it's that role model, basically, where you want to be as good as them, the perfect whatever. And most especially, in the specific context of archery, calls even more to Englishmen, especially in that time period in the medieval ages, since, as you know, medieval archers had their place on the battlefield, it was something that was a common activity throughout society, so you can imagine, if you were to become a real-life Robin Hood, you would gain so much respect, so much fame, the kudos, and of course, the wealth from being the master archer. Everyone would be talking about you and wanting to hire you for your services, much more than maybe a potter or blacksmith. So yes, I think it is something that even today has quite that draw and keeps making people come back to Robin Hood and other such characters, because even though they are, as people, imperfect, they have their flaws, sometimes they have their vices, and they're shown as not always the good guy in some contexts, but when it comes down to what they're good at, their skills, grabbing a bow, grabbing the arrow, and knocking, you know, hitting that target at whatever range, you know they'll always be perfect. And I think that's something that I like as well. You know, I have to admit, if I had the opportunity to become a master archer, or master swordsman, ah oh yes, that would be something special. You never know, maybe one day, or maybe you one day. We'll see. One way the Robin Hood type of folklore seems to appeal not just to men but also to women is in, of course, the character Maid Marian. Now it seems to be a bit of a two-sided coin to her because there is that sort of princess effect, the damsel in, distre in distress with her Prince Charming, Robin Hood, coming over to rescue her, but at the same time she's not just that character who is pathetic and helpless. There are several versions of Robin Hood seen in, for example, modern times or in the stories where Maid Marian actually holds her own. She is someone who perhaps is getting accosted by the bad guys and will grab a bow herself and shoot them in the eye, or will grab a sword and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some brigands and bandits and other ne'er-do-wells. It's that, again, it's that two-sided coin. You've got the character who sort of perhaps wants to be rescued and wants to choose a good husband, but also, on the other hand, wants to be someone who is independent and can support themselves without having to depend on the man. And I can understand that idea, being someone who still lives with their parents, someone who wants to be a bit more independent, I think we can all relate to that kind of concept. So, that's my input for today regarding Robin Hood and the folklore and the history surrounding it that's more interesting and in-depth than you would have thought. Hope you enjoyed it, and as Nick Hodges likes to say, if you liked the show, help the channel grow. But uh, that aside, yeah, please do feel free to have a look at my other stuff. I do talk about things like historical European martial arts and actual fighting in a bit more depth if you want to learn. So, enjoy, and see you on the next one.